any part of uh, what such eminence may governments have to tell us today. Okay, sir. Okay. On behalf of PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, we welcome uh, you all, our distinguished uh, dignitaries, uh, our speakers, our participants, uh, to all uh, in the interactive session on economic reforms and uh, post-COVID-19 growth. Uh, the objective of this special session is to discuss about the effects of various reforms undertaken by the government and the post-COVID economic growth trajectory of the country. Uh, recently, we have observed a sharp recovery in the uh, lead economic indicators, such as IIP recovered from a low of minus 50% to plus 0.2% uh, in the recent months. Uh, so economic recovery is there, which is also visible by the uh, lead economic and uh, business indicators. So uh, going ahead, uh, how this trajectory is going to become fast from the steady zone and then uh, faster as projected by the IMF uh, in the next five years from uh, 2021 uh, to 2025 that uh, India's economic growth trajectory uh, will be high, uh, fastest in the top 10 economies in the world economic system. Uh, so to discuss about uh, the futuristic growth trajectory of the uh, country and uh, government's approach toward various economic reforms in the past in the uh, past many decades. We have uh, two renowned economists with us today, uh, Dr. Arvind Virmani, renowned economist and chairman, EGRO, Foundation of Economic Growth and Welfare, and Dr. Charan Singh Ji, renowned economist, uh, non-executive chairman of uh, Punjab and Sindh Bank and uh, chief executive, EGRO. Uh, so uh, we will have uh, 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 very meaningful and uh, suggestive recommendations for the uh, government after this session. Uh, so uh, with these words, because we have very limited time, uh, now I would like to request uh, our president, Shri Sanjay Agarwalji, uh, to give uh, formal uh, welcome remarks. Uh, it's uh, my real pleasure and honor to welcome our such eminent economists uh, as guests today, uh, Dr. Arvind Barbani and Dr. Charan Singh, uh, who I, I believe uh, are uh, one of the foremost names in the field of economics in our country. I am also very happy to welcome my colleagues, uh, uh, Sri Pradeep Multani, Senior Vice President, PhD Chamber, and Sri Saket Dalmia, Vice President of the PhD Chamber, uh, former presidents and managing committee members, Dr. S. V. Sharma, Chief Economist of the PhD Chamber, other eminent dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon to you all on behalf of the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I welcome you all to today's interactive session on economic reforms and post-COVID-19 growth. Today, we have with us the eminent experts, Dr. Arvind Virmani, who is the chairman of eGrow, Foundation of Economic Growth and Welfare, and Dr. Charan Singh, again, another renowned economist, the non-executive chairman of Punjab and Sindh Bank, and the chief executive of eGrow who will share their views today on the effects of various reforms undertaken by the government and the post-COVID-19 economic growth trajectory of the country. Friends, the government of India has been undertaking proactive and fast-track measures to safeguard its people, economy, trade, and industry against the wild tide of pandemic COVID-19 in this extremely difficult time. The series of stimulus announcements by the government in the last seven, eight months under the At Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan 1.0, 2.0, and now 3.0, along with the measures undertaken by RBI, uh, which have uh, taken together, taken the, you know, bring the total package uh, to a level of around nearly 30 lakh crores. Uh, it's highly encouraging and, uh, uh, and very laudable uh, on the, you know, on the top line basis, on the, on the big number basis, uh, at least. Measures and reforms announced under the Atharbar Bharat uh, Abhiyan 1.0, including reforms for MSMEs, especially the provision of collateral free automatic loans, opening up of all sectors to the private sector, reforms for improving ease of doing business, employment generation, ramping up health and digital education infrastructure, relief measures for agriculture and rural sectors, structural reforms in the area of coal, minerals, defense, airports, and aerospace management, power, space uh, sector, atomic energy sector, and civil aviation, among others, are all very highly appreciable. This should go a long way in our fight against economic distress, reviving and boosting the morale of agriculture, industry, and most importantly, 
each citizen of this nation and will significantly push industrial and economic development of the country. Under the Aatmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan 2.0, the government announced meaningful and calibrated measures to stimulate the consumer demand, boost capital expenditure. Uh, these included LTC cash voucher scheme, one-time restoration of festival advance to the government employees, provision of a 50-year interest-free loan of rupees 12,000 crores for capital expenditure by the states, and proposed allocation of rupees 25,000 crores for capital expenditure on roads, defense, infrastructure, uh, water supply, uh, urban development, and uh, domestically produced capital equipment. Recently, the government also announced bold economic reforms under the Aatmanirbhar Bharat, Abhiyan 3.0, such as Aatmanirbhar Bharat Rozgar Yojana, the extension of emergency credit line guarantee scheme, production-linked incentive scheme for 10 champion sectors, reduction in the performance security on contracts, income tax relief to developers and home buyers, among others. These will have a multiplier effect on the economic growth trajectory through enhanced demand job creation, increased private investments, escalated imports, and growth of sectors that have strong backward and forward linkages. Friends, the recovery in the key economic and business indicators on the back of string of economic reforms announced by the government in the last 78 months have instilled uh, the expectation of a strong, sustainable, and even positive growth in Q3 of FY 2021 with robust resumption of the lost economic activity. Recently, the PSD Chamber, on the basis of the PSD CCI Economic and Business Momentum Index, the EBM index as we prefer to call it now, uh, estimated that the GDP growth will be around minus 7.9% for the full financial year 2021, as compared to the median forecast of minus 9.3 by various national and international forecasting organizations. We are quite confident and hopeful that the economy shall be back on its high growth trajectory sooner rather than later and will become the fastest growing economy among the top 10 major economies from 21-22, as per the IMF projections. One major concern, although, that the Chamber has, despite uh, all these measures, is that uh, the effective fiscal spend which is the actual cash released by the government into the economy, which should be the, the main tool for spurring demand. On that front, uh, you see the, 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 the cut in the government expenditure on the central side has been roughly 4 lakh crores for the first three quarters of this financial year, against which the fiscal impact uh, by the end of this, this year of all the uh, of all the uh, Bharat uh, uh, schemes probably may not even touch 4 lakh crores in terms of actual spend. Uh, this, uh, we feel uh, strongly, is actually taking away uh, a good part of the vitality in demand from the economy. And one would rather expect that there should be a major investment into the infrastructure rather than just reallocating. And, in, and reallocation, in any case, by definition, means that you stop what is happening already. So that by itself causes a disruption. And then, you try to release monies where you are trying to divert them uh, uh, in, in terms of the targeted uh, expectations. And that, again, uh, is also going to take time. So this is one major uh, uh, you know, concern that the Chamber has, that uh, despite most of the economies across the world uh, really uh, spending uh, a huge amount and up to 10-15% of their GDPs in actual cash expenditures, we are being quite conservative. And whether uh, this is the right approach to take, uh, considering the fact that the demand growth that is going to take place, at least initially, is majorly going to come from the infrastructure investments that the government is going to make in the, uh, due to the weakness in the sentiments of the, uh, of the private uh, investors or, or even the state governments. In any case, I think uh, we stand to be... Uh, uh, I think it, uh, uh, getting some very uh, uh, detailed uh, views and information from, uh, from Dr. Bhamani and Dr. Charan Singh today. And I really hope that we'll get some very valuable insights today on the path that the Indian economy is going to take. Uh, on this note, I once again welcome you all to the today's session and request Dr. Sharma to take the program forward, please. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your optimism about the economic growth trajectory of the country. And uh, uh, with the multiplier effect, the economy is going to attain its uh, lost trajectory in the next uh, very few quarters. Uh, so now I would uh, re request uh, Dr. Arvind Virmani and uh, Dr. Charan Singh uh, uh, for their presentation on the uh, econo economic uh, growth trajectory of the country. And uh, before that, I would like to uh, provide some um, a few points about uh, our esteemed panelist, uh, Dr. Arvind Virmani is president of the Forum uh, for Strategic Initiatives and uh, uh, of Chintan. Uh, <clears throat> now currently he is the chairman of the ECRO. Uh, and, uh, uh, he was a he was in the technical advisory committee of RBI on monetary policy from uh, February 2013 to 2016. Executive director at the International Monetary Fund, Washington DC, and represented uh, India um, in the IMF. And uh, he has been an advisor to the Indian government uh, uh, at the highest level for 25 years, including the chief economic advisor, Ministry of Finance, and principal advisor, Planning Commission. Uh, and Dr. Charan Singh. Uh, 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 he is currently serving as the non-executive chairman of Punjab and Sindh Bank. He was full-time visiting faculty and former RBI chair professor uh, during 2012 to 2016 at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, uh, India, where he taught uh, comparative monetary policy and policy issues in the Indian economy. Uh, I think it will take uh, more than half an hour to uh, provide uh, their uh, full profile. So I, I will be uh, very, very brief. Uh, uh, so. Uh, would uh, directly uh, invite uh, Dr. Virmani and Dr. Charan Singh to uh, provide the presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, respected uh, 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 Dr. Arvind Virmani. Uh, please thank provide the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary uh, uh, General Saab and uh, President and Vice Presidents. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I should uh, add that uh, this is the first uh, business group that I am speaking to on, on this particular issue, which I think is very important for the future growth. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll be focusing that, on the long-term issues, medium long-term from next year. The, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, this normalization, fiscal uh, stimulus issues, etc., we can take up if uh, that is of great concern in the question and answers. So I will go straight into my presentation. Then I'll ask Professor Charan Singh to uh, say a few uh, uh, words uh, on, I don't want to start by introducing our foundation. Maybe after we've had the presentation, uh, Dr. Charan Singh will say a few words on that. Then we can start the question uh, and, and the discussion. So uh, uh, let me, uh, so uh, what I'm uh, going to talk about, is what, you know, give a little idea of what, when economists like me uh, talks about uh, reform, what do we mean? You know, what is the goal of market reforms? And it's basically the acceleration of economic growth. And I'll give you a very brief history of that. Uh, and then uh, after acceleration, it's sustaining fast growth. And this period uh, starts from 2004. But what we find is, uh, so we were successfully accelerated growth from 1980 to 2003, and then uh, we failed in this sustaining growth portion because the goals change from economic to social. I'll give you some idea of that. So economic growth actually slowed. And then you had, uh, from 2014, you had a, a government where the goals were somewhat mixed. Uh, there was uh, some institutional reform, but also then a reversion to kind of moral social uh, goal primacy. And so there was growth recovery was followed by a little bit of decline. And then the, the main point of this uh, presentation that in Modi too, from uh, around June of 2019, there was a realignment of goals uh, towards growth, uh, which is uh, results we see from next year onwards. So uh, basically what that means is that uh, the, the uh, objective, the primary objective went back to re-accelerating the economic growth. Because of this slowdown, it was no longer a question of just maintaining growth. It became again kind of re-accelerated and, and the major policy reforms which were initiated in September. So uh, I think many of you old, uh, of my generation are familiar with the bureaucratic slow, uh, uh, socialism where growth slowed and poverty actually increased. You know, And then we had market liberalization for 1980. I will show that uh, you know, most many people think it started in 90s. 
uh, but it actually started in 1980. And, and the basic idea of liberalization was you have reforms to promote competition and productivity growth. This accelerates and sustains fast growth. Fast growth in turn means that revenues go up, tax and non-tax revenues, and then you have more and more uh, to spend on welfare programs. So rather than starting from welfare, you start from growth, you generate revenues, uh, and, and then uh, you spend them efficiency. So efficiency is also fo focused. You focus on public goods, externalities, and the things where government is vital. So th that's a basic change, you know, from socialism to market. It's not that we are not, we are all concerned with public welfare, but the approach is different. So what is it that uh, accelerating great growth. So what happens in the 1980s reforms was very selective decontrol and external trade. Yet we find there was a tremendous group, uh, increase in the uh, growth rate of per capita GDP. Per capita GDP is really the way we actually measure welfare of the public. Rather than GDP, we normally talk about GDP because that's a number which keeps coming out every day. But when we measure the welfare effects, we measure per capita, and you will see that there was a tripling of growth, which is very surprising to many people because people don't talk about this. The thing is, the bureaucratic socialism had so suppressed the economy and taken it to the bottom one fourth of growth in the world, which had made it so bad that even uh, initial reforms produced a tremendous outpouring of growth, so to say, uh, entrepreneurial spirits, private sector, et cetera. Then the 90s reforms, of course, were very uh, comprehensive. I just put it there for the record because many people don't really under, remember or, or know that this has happened. Price, production, capacity, trade, everything was reformed. Investment was all controlled and decontrolled. Earlier it was controlled, it was decontrolled, capital markets, external trade uh, on tariffs, etc. Uh, exchange rate, we went from dual to uniform to market driven. Uh, and then the whole banks, equity market, financial sector, the whole complex of things was reformed. But the rate of growth increased in per capita GDP terms increased from 3.9% per year to minus 5.5, uh, sorry, to 5.5% approximately. That's about a 50% uh, growth. So if you see this marked in red, there was a threefold increase in growth rate in the 80s reform, which were very modest but only a 50% growth when we were already going a bit, a bit better. But what this did in cumulatively was to put us in the top uh, one fourth of the fastest growing economies in the world. So once you are at a higher level, the, the lesson which a uh, lot of research has been done on is, is when you get to a fast growth level, the issue becomes of sustaining that growth. Okay, if you neglect that sustaining, you go back, which is what happened in India. So. Uh, so the issue of sustaining growth in, in, the, uh, in the government, which was there from 99 to around 2003, 4, there were actions taken. Infrastructure reform started. The main focus was infrastructure reform. And the idea was to introduce competition, private competition into government monopoly. So there was a new telecom policy, uh, highways and rural road, electricity act, ports, uh, some uh, private entry into airports, etc. Uh, so there was a whole slew of infrastructure reform, but infrastructure reforms take time. It takes time to get the benefits. And there was also initiation of CPSC, the privatization policy, though very little was actually done. It was initiated and then became very controversial. But reform, in per, I mean, the, still we had an effect of taking per capita income growth to about 6% per year. So this kind of put us, uh, you know, as I explained, into the top one fourth uh, of uh, top 10% actually of the uh, performing economies in the world. So, uh, and then uh, this kind of, uh, to, to uh, then we needed, we, we got a change in goals. You know, uh, I retired as a chief economic advisor in 2009 and I had warned, I had warned in before leaving. And I said this in interviews also, I wrote a paper which was published in the OECD volume on four countries, comparative growth, that pending reform must continue gradually, no need for big bang reforms, but they must continue if you are to sustain the growth. However, the focus completely changes to change to social goals. So th this uh, advice was not followed. 
So, uh, so this is where we, we start the main presentation now that you can take that as a uh, background. So what were the issues which were pending? I think it's important to know that. And hopefully we will also have some discussion from your uh, chamber, your uh, people on, on whether there are other things which I, I missed, so to say. So competitive, what are the issues at this point in time uh, when we come, come into the uh, 2014, the new government? So there were a number of structural imbalances. Uh, one of the most important was that agriculture, uh, agriculture shares and GDP in employment. So GDP was had come down to something like 20%. Agricultural GDP was down to 20% or so. But the employment uh, dependence was between 60 and 70%. So huge imbalance between the share, agricultural shares in GDP and employment. So it's a fundamental structural imbalance. Agricultural productivity for 50 years, 50% 50 of the world average, not the best, the world average, we were at 50% uh, labor productivity in agriculture and, uh, and heavy rural unemployment. This structural problem remains uh, till uh, we start. And then of course, there were cost and quality factors. You would uh, know these much better, but from what studies we have seen, the, the labor uh, issues, uh, inflexible labor, uh, land cost issues, land reform issues, capital management, uh, across all these factor markets, they were, uh, you know, uh, in the first three, at least land and capital estimates have been made that Indian costs are 20 to 25% higher than our competitors. Education and skills, the quality of education was very poor. Though we have a universal education system, uh, government uh, free education, yet the quality was very poor. Uh, power electricity costs, again, estimates of 50 to 25% higher for industry. Uh, imported inputs, people kept complaining about, and of course, employment. We do very play, poorly in labor intensive uh, exports, etc. So, uh, uh, then uh, uh, there were other issues, rela uh, issues related to public sector monopolies. Uh, which were basically so inefficient that they were a drain. You know, originally they were set up to improve the competitive environment. They had become a complete drain. Uh, they still are in many cases. Public enterprises, drain on resources, losses, accumulated losses, etc. Uh, but not social welf welfare and answer as, as anticipated. And then, of course, government e efficiency and corruption issues, taxation and tax bureaucracy, targeting of transfers, the leakages we've all discussed, uh, and then programs and project, projects, the delivery uh, was not good. And then of course, at the end, uh, kind of related, but not exactly economic issues, the legal system, which people have talked about. So this big agenda of problems, issues, and need for reform. So uh, Modi one did uh, uh, two or three very noteworthy reforms, which I just want to mention. The Indian bankruptcy code, we are all familiar with now. A monetary policy uh, committee with flexible inflation targeting, and, and of course, the goods and uh, uh, services tax, the GST, which was a revolutionary change in the constitution. Of course, each of these has some weaknesses, and I'll just briefly uh, outline and tell you what uh, the impact was after this. And then, of course, there were reforms uh, related to natural resources, oil, coal, mineral spectrum. The, the policy which I had been recommending for decades, uh, including, uh, as you mentioned, as member of the TRI, the sale of uh, these natural resources through auction. That is the best way. Of course, auctions, again, have weaknesses. They, they are not uh, well designed, but at least that was a big step to go from uh, first come, first serve and other such methods to uh, auction. Then, of course, the big things was uh, the direct benefit transfer, Aadhaar, uh, Jandan accounts and, and move to DCT by farmers. So uh, these were some of the, uh, and of course, uh, the unconventional reforms, I would say, digital India, e-governance, the uh, GEM market, UPI, uh, etc. on the digital front also, uh, uh, something new uh, 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 was done. And greater emphasis on tech startups, because as you know, uh, self-employment constitutes a huge proportion of uh, employment in India and this uh, emphasis on tech startups, you know, rather than traditional uh, uh, self-employed, uh, so change toward modern quality jobs uh, through tech startups. I think that was a big change, this recognition that for the 
21st century, we need uh, this new approach to self-employment. And then of course, the environmental issues. Now, what actually happened, uh, even though there were these uh, reforms, so kind of what went wrong in a sense. So, uh, you know, after the initial steps toward growth revival, I think the, the objective, the goals again, changed kind of back to uh, moral and social goals. You know, a slew of anti-corruption laws were implemented, demonetization, we are all familiar. Uh, and then uh, even the reform, the three reforms I mentioned, IBC, GST, MPC, uh, th there is something called the J curve effect, which means that initially if you do, uh, if they are not very, very carefully uh, thought of, uh, implemented, phased in, then you get these negative initial effects. So we, in all these three cases, for example, the monetary uh, policy, there were huge forecasting errors, which resulted in very high real rates. So uh, contrary to uh, expectations of these, uh, there are weaknesses which uh, resulted in uh, uh, kind of initial negative effects. I think all these will pan out eventually. And of course, there were the legacy problems of twin debt and companies, which we've been suffering with the NPA problem, which you're familiar with, uh, that uh, which hasn't really been uh, sorted out to complete satisfaction. And, 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 and therefore, all these, uh, uh, again, you know this, uh, in early 2019, there was a fall in credibility of reforms and market uh, confidence fell and uh, uh, GDP growth and investment declined. So, so this is the background. Uh, you have already, uh, President has already indicated some of the uh, where, where we were, uh, uh, which I'll come back to. Uh, but uh, around uh, August of last year, uh, you know, July to, to June, July, August, uh, there, there was a change, I think, in the approach of the government. And what was the change? So the, the change was signaled uh, by the corporate tax reform, which took all of us by surprise, I must say. I mean, I have been recommending, I think I'm sure you have been recommending corporate tax reform, but the, uh, I, I think in September, when 25% uh, reduction was announced, uh, supply chain for new manufacturing units, 15%, this was the first indication that the government was uh, reorienting its goal back and, and beginning to be concerned about the growth rate as, as it should be. Uh, and then this was uh, uh, then a whole number of after that the uh, government monopolies I told you was a problem, and the the effort to start private competition in these a uh, whole bunch of sectors coal oil defense has been going on for some time. But again, uh, the opening of space atomic energy gave a signal that the government was serious about eliminating government monopolies not just by selling off these things but by bringing competition. And remember, competition is what increases productivity and growth. So uh, second one. So third one, the strategic industry policy framework. Uh, it's very important because this is the first time the government has taken the bull by the horn, so, and so, so to say. Remember what I said that in the Vajpayee government, there was an initial privatization was started. One hotel was privatized. And then there was a whole slew of cases, legal things, and problems. So governments have been very afraid to move further on this. So I think it's very important this strategic policy framework must be completed and announced because it will set the stage for the for a continuous uh, uh, privatization. It is not I, th that the privatization has all occurred or will happen suddenly all over the place, but the framework is very important because it will give a good foundation uh, for the privatization of uh, CPSCs, which are also occurring. Education policy, again, you know, uh, I, I still remember uh, th three or four years ago, I wrote a, a, a blog on uh, when, when this uh, uh, make in India thing came out, I said, educate in India. Why aren't we thinking of educate in India? Okay, a large proportion of our uh, youth go abroad for training. They spend a lot of money. Uh, if Even if we, if we brought uh, these educational institutions to India, you would at least save, save the residence cost. Uh, and you also would probably save uh, uh, education uh, costs. So private and foreign debt, this is a very important policy, which I don't think has been given enough attention uh, that it now allows private and foreign entry. And of course, agriculture, uh, which has happened recently, everybody is familiar with uh, the Essential Commodity Act amendments, the Farmers Produce uh, Act, et cetera, which has opened up 
uh, three or four new channels for competition in the sale of uh, uh, farm produce, uh, which will have uh, significant effects on new agricultural production, new allied production going forward. It, it won't have an immediate effect because uh, Mondays will still keep operating, but for the future, uh, it opens up great uh, opportunities. And of course, the labor codes, uh, which uh, again, uh, uh, you're all familiar that reduction of 44 labor uh, codes into four, 29 of these 44 were, of course, central acts. Uh, the rules are being framed, etc. And again, I, I think the, uh, the, the public, the, the industry, whether it's foreign industry, uh, FDI, etc., have not fully appreciated how important uh, this set of reforms is. And finally, electric amendment bill, which is going to be very important for this electric cost issue, because the distribution is still controlled by uh, uh, by state electricity boards. And we have been trying, I still recall again, my last committee, which I chaired when I was in, Gov in planning commission, was trying to get the states to accept uh, that uh, reforms in distribution, which haven't happened. So government is trying again uh, to, to uh, reform the act to incentivize this process. Now, uh, uh, before I go forward, the, these, uh, I, in my view, are, are major, major reforms which are going to lay the basis for future growth. But we, we, of course, have to remember we are in a pandemic and things are quite bad in the world. So I think these are not enough. So I think some of the pending reforms which I'll outline, the government, we must keep taking these up with the government and, and trying to kind of uh, uh, press them to, to complete these. One is um, very important for MSMEs and I'm sure for PhDC chamber is the GST simplification. We, we have done a major paper at EGRO on, uh, on, on the uh, GST and how to simplify it. But uh, two points here, uh, that roughly 60% to two thirds of the reform have been done. But that last mile, the last 40% or last one third is very important for MSMEs uh, because the costs the compliance costs, et cetera, have gone up uh, for the small people. And I think this is uh, going to be the biggest benefit for MSMEs. It's very important. The second one is the direct tax code. Uh, as you all know, the current uh, 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 income tax code is, is a huge poti like this. And in 2009, uh, one of the last meetings I attended as CA uh, was to approve uh, a 240 page uh, code, which is roughly this much uh, in size, <laughs> if you go by the size. Uh, and, and government had, in this government also set up a committee again, all the, all, it's all ready, what I mean to say is. Uh, both these things, uh, I hope, are done uh, by the time of the, the next budget. And again, this is very important for MSCs and startups. And I hope, again, you will take up this issue uh, because uh, people, you know, when we talk to the general public, they think of Oh, salaried people, income tax. No, I mean, for small people uh, who have to actually file their uh, income tax return, this is a very, very important uh, code for the MSCs and startups. So simplify, rationale, and bring in global best practice will again have uh, big effects on the MSME sector, positive effects, I believe. And, and of course, the <clears throat> uh, increase in marginal tax rates, uh, which was done in the previous, uh, I think, the 29 interim budget uh, uh, needs to be uh, reversed, if not uh, fully, but uh, gradually. Uh, because it, it, in my view, it is beyond uh, the tax minimizing rate. You know, it's too high, even for maximizing taxes in the long run. Uh, short term things will get whittled away. Then the direct tax uh, transfer, uh, cash transfer scheme, I think is very important. We've had the uh, uh, problem of uh, migrants, etc., which has become very important and has come up again, even in a political context. But I think if we had a direct cash transfer uh, scheme, which was linked also to the mobile uh, uh, thing, you could have given uh, this migrants money right in their hand. It's a huge empowerment for the poor people. Instead of having 10, 20 different programs, subsidies all over the place, huge bureaucracy, if you could just combine all these and put into a single uh, direct cash. You could uh, calculate in all different ways, but the bottom line would be a certain amount of money uh, and given to uh, Aadhaar link uh, mobile phone. And this would be a big improvement in efficiency of the welfare system and better targeting, far superior targeting. Skills, 
this is an area which i should point out which uh, sometimes is neglected uh, that for a modern industry uh, i think the small industry is not so affected but the medium and large industry can very clear because um, you know education is not enough people have to be trained in the manufacturing so apprenticeship act is very important to make it convenient for you to hire uh, people who are educated but untrained uh, and and there, there are a lot of problems with this in the current act uh, and it's but it's not very difficult to reform it should be on your agenda uh, which will make you which will then mean that once people are trained they can also uh, move and be employed in medium scale industry and small scale industry so once they are trained a large industry is probably better uh, able to do this export of textiles there there are certain areas of the uh, tariffs which are uh, still unreformed uh, this has to do with uh, quantity restriction and qrs there are specific duties in, in textiles and, and and so on this need to be reformed and finally the ease of doing business uh, you know decriminalization again an issue i'm sure you are you have taken up uh, when this affects more the corporates but uh, i guess some of the large uh, Mem members would be affected. The digitization, post-file audit, just a simplification of regulatory system. Of course, forty percent of, sixty uh, percent of regulations are at the state level, but the the central government could have model acts which they can implement in SECs and, and UTs which are under their control, and that would have a good uh, effect uh, on the states, which would eventually have to do much of the heavy lifting. Uh, and then, of course, the financial sector. And resiliency related to NPAs and yield curve, and the states I already mentioned. So uh, uh, the, the last few uh, five slides. Uh, let, let me look forward. So pending reforms I've mentioned, which are very important given the uncertainties in the system, but there are number of op opportunities uh, which are, uh, you know, the silver lining in the clouds globally. Uh, and let me just point these out because we need to exploit these opportunities also one is a deglobalization trend this is something we predicted in in 2008 9 it has been happening the ratio of trade to global gdp etc has uh, been going down fdi work visas etc but india is actually can benefit from this one of the things the pandemic has shown is remote working and india is well placed to to uh, to take advantage of it plus india's share in trade global trade has not gone down our share in uh, fdi for emerging markets has actually gone up so uh, though the overall trend is negative we, we are actually a better place then high tech decoupling uh, this whole uh, china issue uh, the pandemic etc the blame which uh, has gone on china uh, this, this high tech decoupling which trump has, mr uh, president trump has started will is going to continue and therefore we we can be part of the camp of the high uh, developed countries uh, which can benefit from this value chain uh, shifting supply chain diversification uh, you perhaps familiar uh, with the uh, sclr uh, sc uh, supply chain resiliency initiative that japan has started in which we have been invited japan australia india india and the other southeast asian countries uh, can benefit from this so this is something again Uh, you should be aware of and and look out for. Uh, beyond this, I think that what we need is what I call a dualistic trade policy. That is, we need a import substituting policy vis-a-vis -vis China, but a free trade policy with respect to uh, rest of the world. This is the thing which we can maximize our high tech uh, coupling, our supply chain, because really, uh, again, people don't realize. And when in this RCEP discussion, I'm hearing. supply chains don't end in china they end in the us so if you are going to be part of the supply chains where which will benefit india we really need to be connected uh, the the free trade agreement etc you need is with the us and eu not with china okay so this is a, an old man mindset people keep projecting and speaking i am amazed at how many people i've heard on tv and elsewhere it's like a mantra they keep repeating without seeing what the change in the world is so uh, so, so the, this dual trade policy as i said uh, which requires temporary tariffs very important where we feel miserably in the uh, indira gandhi uh, tariff increases was 
that one tariff increase led to another, 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 till we had built up a huge uh, pattern of protection, 300% tariffs. What you need is temporary time-limited tariffs, about four or five years maximum, and well-targeted, well-phased, combined with the product link incentive scheme. So this is a very important scheme again, uh, which I'm very happy, which also gives me an indication that perhaps government has started thinking in this direction uh, of uh, uh, combining an incentive uh, with, a, uh, with temporary protection, not permanent protection. Permanent protection is the worst thing you can do, but very careful targeting uh, for import substitution vis-a-vis -vis China can produce tremendous results while you open up to EU and US which is where your supply chains and value chains can go. And, and the rest of the world, as I said, we should make it simpler, not more difficult. So I hope the government will reverse some of the uh, tariffs uh, which don't fit into this category, which tariffs which they uh, did over the last three, two, three years. And free trade agreements I've already mentioned, supply chain resiliency I mentioned. So very, uh, I don't know if, if how much time we have, uh, but I just want to point, point out for uh, uh, this Atma Nirbhar Bharat now is, is uh, you know, is different from Make in India. It's about self-reliance and self-confidence. Uh, global market to national, it's about linking local markets to global and vice versa. You know, the, the, the local market to link to national and to global. So I think the orientation from uh, Make in India to Atma Nirbhar is a good one. I'm not sure we are 100% of the way there, but I think a very, very uh, good uh, change in uh, direction has been word, uh, made. Uh, PM has emphasized this, you are uh, well aware, the three Ds, uh, and it's about, uh, it's really, and this is a point I make to foreigners, uh, is that it's about economic competitiveness. I have, uh, that domestic reforms, you must remember, that is the whole point. The point as I, so I had to say was, is to increase the economic competitiveness so that protections are less and less needed. Again, repeat, temporary protection for a phase, very careful phasing combined with PLI can be useful, but general protection is not. It just makes the economy competitive. So domestic reforms are happening, which is what gives me that the hope for the future. Supply chains, I mentioned EODV in foreign trade, this is another area I mentioned foreign trade policy, but the ease of business. You know, we have seen how uh, in the Modi one government, the ease of doing business indices, we have uh, progressed something like 70 or 75. Uh, I think we moved to 70 uh, correctly, but uh, EODB in foreign trade has not improved that much. Uh, it is now in process. So that is very important for supply chains and capital subsidy I mentioned, uh, very important, it's different. Uh, the Chinese did credit subsidies, which go on and on uh, and are very objectionable, but one-time capital subsidy to build scale. That's the important thing about PLI. It's about scale because our, our the scale of our uh, industry is not competitive. That's the only reason why Chinese products are more competitive here because we are small scale competing with their huge scale. So if we can come up to minimum efficient scale, that's all you need to do. If minimum efficient scale is 100,000, we don't need to have a hundred, a million scale like they do. Once we are at that minimum efficient scale, we can compete. So, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, depending on time, I, uh, again, uh, uh, let me quickly go through the other these new opportunities which have arisen, uh, digitization. We were behind in digitization from the uh, developed countries and, uh, and now there is a chance for faster catch up. So this whole digital economy is now going to boom uh, much more. So. I think all of your uh, members should be paying much more uh, attention. That doesn't mean you have to all become digital, but you must pay uh, more attention to it. Uh, the, the, and, and the social sector, I think where we can pioneer e-medicine, e-education, skilling. Given the huge size of our population, it is kind of virtually impossible uh, uh, to, to physically, all the physical uh, uh, connectivity to 1.4 billion people. So I, I still remember again, I don't want to name the hospital, but it's one of the best in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, when it was uh, new, it used to be speak and span, a few people you would see. I went there uh, about three, four years ago, and it looked like a railway station to me. You know, we just have too many people. 
we, we, they, it's impossible to come up to the standards of the, uh, the developed countries. Of course, we will have, have to build lots of hospitals and we will, but the e-medicine is going to be a very important complement because you only need the hospital for where you need to do physical stuff like surgery, but rest of it can all be done on, on thing. And I think we are going to be pioneers in this area. Uh, public good infrastructure, uh, well, e-governance, et cetera, you heard of Aadhaar, uh, uh, the digital platform that government has been building, that's the right approach. You know, the, the economic theory tells us that government should provide public good infrastructure, which everybody can use. Private sector can't do it. They have to provide the money. They have to provide the, the, the push for it. So the, the, the government, again, is, I think, on the right track on this, uh, focusing on things that they only can do and do well. Uh, futuristic regulations on e comm social media, we need to do more on this. We have started, but uh, again, I think government has seized on the, for example, the Privacy Act uh, uh, on digital privacy, et cetera, uh, localization of data and, and protection from foreign countries and their spying. And again, another strength we can build on is public health. Uh, pharma and drugs, you're all very well aware, and the Swachh Bharat uh, mission, uh, which we already have and is doing well, we need to expand that. <coughs> Uh, to do other things to deal with the pandemic. These I'm going to just leave because a lot of people ask questions. We can come back if there's a question. People say, well, what about employment related reform? So I've just listed them that these among the reforms I've already talked about, there are a whole bunch which are, in my view, directly linked to faster generation of employment. And I just list them and leave them here. Then conclusion. Okay, now we uh, discuss where are we? So, uh, Again, I think you already noticed that the growth rate for FY20, the last year actually has come down to 4.2% GDP, which in per capita GDP terms is back in that first stage. Remember, I told you the first stage of reform, we went from 1.9 to uh, tripling, 1.3 to 1.3.9, uh, tripling of growth. We are now back in that range uh, because Q4 was 3.1. This is GDP now, this is not per capita. You have to subtract about 1.2% for population. So if you take 4.2 minus 1.2, it's 3%. So we have to re-accelerate growth now. It's not no longer a question of being able to sustain fire growth. So that, uh, and of course, uh, the forecast in May, which I made for current year, coming to the current year, uh, was probably the most optimistic. I'm glad to hear that you are, uh, I was surprised. I didn't know you have a forecast of minus 7.9 because the majority uh, of those uh, which I have seen uh, are at minus 10 or less. There are a few between uh, minus 9% and minus eight. I think you're the first one who, who have put me on record that you're minus 7.9. My focus in a way is minus 7.5 or uh, better, which remains the most optimistic. Uh, but then both of us will be, if it turns out, we will both be equally, almost equally uh, right. Uh, Sir, I okay. think we have stuck our neck out, but uh, we, do, uh, we do really believe in it. And uh, if yeah. once we have corroborated our numbers, I think that gives us uh, probably well, even more reason for optimism. I would say. This, this is my May forecast. I haven't even <laughs> changed it because I did. we did it on the basis of research, <laughs> uh, which papers are also on our EGRO if somebody is interested. Technically. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I mean, that's excellent. I, I congratulate you. I think you're very good. That's our well, economist. That's our chief economist, Mr. Dr. S.P. Sharma, who's done yeah. all the... That's right. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so let me quickly, because I don't want to, I want to get it, uh, your participation. I don't want to take all the time. This is the last slide. Uh, so, uh, uh, growth rate in Q1 has come out. It was minus 23.5. Q2 is expected to be around minus 8.5. And what I had also said was that we would probably, we would normalize by Q4. And normalization, I defined as being at the same level rough as we were a year before. So, as, uh, but now it looks at uh, Q3 uh, itself, by the end of Q3, we may be at normal with a 0% growth. Again, uh, I congratulate you. I think your uh, statement was very similar to that, President Saab. Uh, so what is the primary goal uh, of Modi too? It has to be, and I think there is now, re-accelerating growth. And what is feasible? We have I've outlined major big bang reform. People don't realize I'm hearing statements by people who are supposedly well informed who don't recognize how important these reforms are. That's why I put them, uh, the old reforms also, they can compare how many reforms we've done now compared to the infrastructure 
and the previous reform. These are big bank reforms. They are major reforms. Okay, but uh, I, I still believe that if we want to really go full hog, the, the remaining reform which I have outlined and which I hope you will take up uh, with the government must be completed. If we are really to see the full benefits, why? Because it's a very, uh, uh, very uh, poor domain, uh, international environment. It's very bad because of pandemic. So, so to minimize the risk from slower world growth, which remains, which will remain for at least another year. Uh, and, and to maximize the opportunity. That is why I have listed out uh, some of the new trends and opportunities which have arisen. But if, if these reforms are completed, uh, and this is the first time I'm putting my uh, forecast on record is here, is that FY22, we would have uh, double digit growth, uh, plus minus, of course, there's still the uncertainty. So I put it at uh, minus 1%, uh, because we still don't know for sure 100% what current rate will be that uncertainty uh, uh, remains. Uh, but if these reforms are completed uh, by March or maybe a little later, uh, we can expect uh, five years thereafter of an average of 7.5% uh, growth, which is kind of close to uh, back at the maximum levels we saw uh, after the, the big reforms uh, of, of the 90s and 2000s. Okay, thank you. That is it. And uh, I'm open to all questions. As I said, if, if people are uh, interested in discussing the current, uh, which I call the transition period to normalcy, I focused on the future, but we can also discuss that. Uh, but before that, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Charan Singh, do you want to say something now or maybe later? I think your presentation was excellent and it's so complete. Uh, I think I will, uh, so I just want to add two things and then the about EGRO, I thought I could say a little later uh, to the to the presentation by Dr. Virmani. I just want to say that I think that the MSMEs have a very important role to play in the days to come and we need to do something on that. And I've been doing research on MSMEs and writing that a time has come now to not only have Indian Institute of Management, we need to have Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship where we handhold train on long-term basis, the young demography of India to start their own enterprises. So I think that's one thing which I would like to add the, and which Dr. Virmani has covered, I'm just elaborating. The second issue is in the supply chain of finances for the type of growth which Dr. Virmani has just presented, I think NBFCs will play a very important role in days to come. And therefore we need to do something for the NBFCs. The uh, second last point I want to make is, and Dr. Virmani mentioned about it, in, the, in this world where the world contours are changing, there have to be an alternative to China. It was too much of a mono, monopolistic power that China was holding. And Dr. Virmani has brought in a new insight. Where do the supply chains start and end? And if they are starting and ending in Europe, we need to really think of how can the foreign registered companies open offices in India? And the additional point to what Dr. Virmani mentioned, I was thinking if we could use our embassies to tell the world how diverse in climate, in resources, India is and how rich India is in terms of demographic and the skills and how undeveloped is and therefore lots of potential in Northeast. And we have a long coastline. We have a huge mining states in terms of Risa and Bihar. So we have everything that anybody would want. And therefore companies, instead of shifting to Bangladesh, Vietnam, or Estonia, I think our embassies need to market that India is a great potential. Closely related to this is the last point. We, if we have to cater to the $5 trillion and the $20 trillion economy, we need to develop many clusters in our country. We right now have, except the four, uh, other than the four metropolitans, we have Hyderabad and Bangalore. I think we need to think in terms of what are we opening in Northeast and what are we opening in North. So with this, I think, uh, just wanted to supplement Dr. Virmani. And uh, I, uh, to introduce about the think tank when Dr. Virmani gives us time, because I do not want to uh, do
do not want the flow of thought which is happening with dr virmani's presentation to stop i will just uh, go back to dr virmani and i think time to open for question answers uh, mr sharma you will take uh, whatever uh, please uh, yes sir uh, thank you very much for a very very comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, very good statistics and uh, your forecasting about the economic indicators uh, for the gdp and we appreciate uh, your forecasting as always Uh, and now uh, we would uh, like to invite some uh, questions from the audience sides and uh, we are open and, uh, to answer the questions uh, from uh, dr virmani and dr charan singh side so uh, panelist you may uh, raise your hands and you you can put up your question on the chat box I think doctor uh, sir, sir there are a few uh, questions uh, sorry sorry somebody spoke yeah uh, yes sir uh, uh, there is some question from uh, mr sham kodar he is uh, uh, from our managing committee uh, uh, he is saying that uh, use of reserve most productive way and reduce cost of interest for industries so he is asking for uh, use of reserves i believe uh, he is asking about the foreign Correct exchange reserve. reserves yes so yeah, I, uh, i would request dr virmani to uh, elaborate on yeah. the same so so you know the, the uh, one has to be very careful uh, for the fall let me try and explain uh, and just as an anecdote which may interest you uh, in my uh, i don't know uh, quarter century in government i never went outside uh, you know firstly i never went to except once over my immediate bosses had do i used to know the prime minister i never uh, used to go uh, above uh, the thing and also i never went out one there are one occasions which i let you about the one where i actually wrote a, a, a paper it's in epw on this reserve issue it's a very important issue but it's very important to understand so i i when this discussion on reserve first arose again i am probably Uh, there are few of you as old as i am uh, but uh, the, the, the issue is that you have to be very careful what you mean by reserve you know you decide on an optimal reserve uh, the rbi uh, incidentally again just for to make it a little more uh, human uh, the only top secret papers i ever saw uh, was on reserves by the way because as chief economic advisor i used to get the a uh, statement of reserves every i forget every month or or every week or something so uh, anyway so so the, the the theory the practice whatever you decide on an optimal reserve right that reserve by definition is untouchable okay there's no question of using that reserve because that's the whole point now you could say that our current reserves or in certain period reserves are more than is optimal whatever defined that we can discuss then they should be there okay you should not have accumulated them okay now if you can navigate this thing you uh, then they would be in public domain they, they should be there for you to use so it really becomes a matter of monetary policy management okay technically you, you can't use reserves which you need for anything else otherwise they are not reserves or don't have them so why do we accumulate more reserves than is necessary this is a good question in monetary policy that you should not accumulate you should let that money for example there is a huge capital inflow let that money go into the system your cost of credit will go down that's what you mean right so this is an issue again uh, in in 2007 when i joined as ca uh, 2006 or 7 again uh, dates are now becoming a little hazy uh, but i wrote a paper which was published in an international journal on management of capital flows okay so this is really a management of capital flows problem and monetary policy problem for 
decreasing capital uh, costs, which is a valid reason. You need more financial sector reforms. Let me, uh, I think you've taken the thing off, but uh, let me just refer to it. Uh, the last, I think, uh, one second, it was in my list of reforms, which are left, it was financial sector reforms and resiliency NPA's yield curve. These are the reforms which are still pending. That is why a cost of capital is too high. We need to do these. And there's a whole bunch of them. And uh, you know they are better financial experts than me who will tell you all the details. But the way to go is not to talk about using reserves, but to introduce competition. We have pointed out several years that 70%, the public sector banks control 70% of the assets. It's too large. There is not enough competition. So you have to address those issues to reduce the costs of capital. Uh, NPAs, the regulatory framework, there is no easy way to reduce cost without doing those reforms. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, now I invite uh, 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 Mr. V. N. Dalmia ji from our managing committee. Uh, he, uh, he has a few uh, questions. Uh, uh, Shri Dalmia ji, please. Dalmiaji, you can put your question. Okay. Um, yeah, I can. Yes, yes, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Virmani, I uh, uh, thank you, first of all, for a spellbinding presentation. Uh, I, I uh, just three points quickly. Uh, firstly, um, you know, this issue of agricultural productivity. Now, uh, the recent reforms, of course, uh, go some way towards addressing that because they allow uh, private sector in and they allow some uh, consolidation of uh, small and marginal land holdings uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, supplying to uh, the private sector and corporate sector, but they don't really address so at least uh, the agricultural reforms so far have not addressed technically the issue of low productivity uh, in the agricultural sector in India, which means basically mechanization, uh, capital investment, subsidies for capital investment, uh, you know, education about new and better methods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's my number one point. Number two point is, you know, this ease of doing business, uh, the ranking improvement, uh, isn't it uh, uh, somewhat true that we've gamed the system and that we haven't really improved the ease of uh, doing business? That, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've addressed uh, um, the World Bank, but have we really addressed uh, reforms on the ground? Um, and my third and last point is, you know, you raised this wonderful point about the Northeast and the Northeast is really a land of opportunity, but connectivity to the Northeast is so poor and so high cost that it makes every option unfeasible. Uh, okay. uh, um, um, so I'm saying uh, that... Uh, um, you know, even that uh, plan to transit goods through Bangladesh uh, hasn't really worked or been implemented fully, uh, which would have shortened the distance. And uh, for instance, the Northeast Ministry was talking about why don't you produce stevia in, uh, in the Northeast? It can be produced very high quality, very cheaply. Um, but okay, it can be. But by the time you bring it to the main markets, it's going to be really expensive. Yeah. Um, um, so um, uh, that's it. Uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, very good questions. Uh, let me start with agriculture. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, let me start with uh, so so the, the issue of uh, you know what are the critical public goods uh, for for agriculture, and you had. Uh, you have indicated some of those. Let me put it in a slightly different form. Uh, so, so first, high value, by the way, is not just capital. Uh, the, the issue, 
I think the much more important issue, which agricultural economists and uh, uh, you know, and learning from them, I have also been pointing out that we are stuck in uh, a subsidized wheat, rice, sugar economy. Okay, unless we get out of that economy, no amount of capital uh, investment is going to give you a sustainable uh, growth and productivity. So, uh, I mean, the code word there used to be high value crops, uh, and uh, uh, the connection may not be obvious, but liberalizing the markets and that contract act are going to be the key because high value doesn't mean what only what we have been saying, horticulture, horticulture. It means developing new markets, new transformations of their products. And many of these will not happen unless private sector food companies are assured of a source of supply. That is why the uh, contract uh, uh, Agricultural Contract Act is critical for developing new markets. So, and developing new high-value crops. So, so there is a link. Okay, but uh, beyond that, I, I agree with your general point, uh, uh, which is, uh, and the second element of that is obviously that at some point we have to stop this huge subsidy, which is linked to the wheat rice uh, economy. And again, you are all familiar with the PBS. Uh, you know, I, I used to deal with that. Such an inefficient, uh, wasteful system. Uh, and and one simple way to do is is to replace it by direct cash transfers. You know, uh, to the farmers, etc., uh, which would be acceptable to 99% of the farmers. One percent will complain. The guys, or maybe a little more, 10%, uh, who who are fattened on this whole uh, system of the wheat rice economy. Uh, th there are, of course, uh, secondly, uh, th th the other public good is information. Absolutely 100% correct. R&D and extension systems have deteriorated terribly. Uh, uh, this is, again, uh, you know, the, the, the 50 years ago, we, we knew that the two most important public goods for productivity were highways and roads, which we are focusing on now, the connectivity of roads, etc., and the R&D and extension system. So, yes. I think we must keep uh, asking for uh, improving the agricultural universities. They should have been bringing in all this technology on everything new, et cetera, uh, and transferring it to the farmer. But now in the modern world, we talked about digital. So this Bharat net is very important. Actually, it's a Modi one program, which kind of didn't go very far and it's been defied. I'm glad it's revived because the connectivity now uh, for both for information uh, whether information for production, sale, whatever, the, the Bharat net is absolutely essential. We have to connect every village in this country and every habitation uh, to the internet in whatever way is feasible. And, and then only you will see this impact of knowledge, you know, when it's accessible uh, knowledge about how to produce, what to produce, uh, where to sell, et cetera, et cetera. There's a third one, uh, there, there's a fourth one which you didn't mention is land. Now land laws is really a, a state issue. Uh, I, I still remember when uh, companies used to tell me that fallow land, we, they at least allow us uh, companies to buy up fallow land and produce and to transform it and produce. Yes, there are still some pending issues. So that point is well taken. I, I, I'm not arguing, I'm just elaborating on your point. I think you should absolutely if you're interested in this issue, you should keep pushing uh, for the additional uh, action, which, which are certainly uh, needed in many states. Uh, so on. Now, uh, the, the, the second one, uh, EODB, uh, uh, absolutely right, uh, you know, but it works both ways. Uh, we are, uh, you know, when it is negative, uh, people say, oh, look at your EODB. Well, we knew before also, it's not new. Uh, that this uh, was only in one uh, um, in one urban area, uh, uh, Delhi and Delhi and Bombay. Uh, we, you know, I, I still remember because I've been in government a long time. In 1990s, when we uh, did reform, we used to say, "Oh, why are you tarring India with one brush? Go and look at X state, Y state, which is doing much better." So yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, but we also now, uh, I think, again, that is something we had proposed when I was in planning commission. We now have EODB indices by state. So uh, whether you're a domestic or a foreign investor, you can uh, do a comparative and say, okay, what is the EODB which worries me most? And where is that the best in the state? 
having said that let me not say that i'm not sympathetic uh, i think they are very good i think team lees has done some excellent work in defining the extent of the uh, problem of uh, regulations uh, the and again it's mentioned here by the way in my list of reforms uh, same page it says decriminalization reduction and digitization of the remaining so this is taken from their uh, study in the sense that they detail yes this absolutely needs to be done and you're very right uh, to keep pushing it uh, in a slightly modified form <laughs> along the lines uh, which i said i mean if you go straight for the criticism maybe that is not a good approach to getting more reform but yes i think your point is well taken uh, 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 dr charan singh do you want to say something on the northeast i think that point sir which you made is very correct on northeast the important point that i would like to mention is the potential that we have there you are right at this point of time there is connectivity issues but once the potential is there and we start getting interest from the foreign companies we can always develop it as we have done the corridors and in other parts of the world corridors have developed we can always have a corridor uh, and there can be agreements which can be signed which will reduce the cost to a great extent we really also need to think and that's a wider issue which we need to think um in case what are the things that we need to provide to bangladesh so that bangladesh is able to make this corridor or facilitate the use of this corridor as you know things have been discussed on these issues on various international forums i think that needs to be strengthened the last point in this is of course in case immediately okay. this can't be done there can be cost subsidy that can be provided so that for a few years we can help the manufacturers by you know, taking care of the extra time or cost that is used uh, in transporting the cost if you look at how china did it china has been giving 10 to 15 years tax holidays also been providing land also been providing shed and also organizing the labor to come and work in those places i think my key issue is if we have to invite the foreign companies we will probably have to match the best in the world and we have to market our country in a way that these these opportunities which are available are known to the rest of the world so that was the point that i i was trying to make i just want to supplement dr virmani's excellent uh, point that he made on the reserve just summarizing it uh, basically in any because i worked in the reserve bank and i uh, handled that issue also i have article in the epw which was high, highly celebrated at that point of time the point is you keep the reserves for two purposes one is the safety and one is returns in a country like india returns do not matter to us because 1991 taught us a lesson so we have to keep in mind safety and as dr virmani was rightly saying some of the reserves are very very essential they cannot be touched that's exactly what the world had been looking at and if you look at the greenspan goodity rule greenspan from america goodity from argentina they were talking about something like 6 months of reserves and if you look at the rangarajan reddy rule which was minted in our country under the high power committee of balance of payments way back in 93 they had suggested about 1 year of international reserves which can take care of all the uh, international obligations at one point of time we had touched about 17 months of our import cover which i thought was very healthy though the reserves in terms of amounts look pretty high this time but i don't think they have yet crossed the one year mark so therefore this hype that the reserves are rising too much and there's an urgency to use it i think has to be tampered with the reality and the historical background that we had in 1990s thank you thank you very much sir uh, now because our time is uh, very limited and time is over and we have to enter our Uh, managing committee meeting also so i would uh, like to invite our vice president uh, shri pradeep multani ji for the vote of thanks thank you very much sharma ji esteemed speakers former presidents and managing committee members eminent, eminent dignitaries ladies and gentlemen a very good afternoon to all of you it is my pleasure to propose a formal vote of thanks vice president mr sakib dalmia and myself to the esteemed speakers and participants in the interactive session on economic reforms and post covid 19 growth i would like to sincerely express my gratitude to our eminent speakers who have spared the valuable time for this session we are very thankful to you for sharing your valuable insight on the subject sir 
esteemed speakers, PhD CCI reaches out to 150,000, 1 lakh 50,000 companies, majority of which are MSMEs. Or, uh, sir, all Indian companies want is that single window service should be provided and ease of doing business should be achieved. And ease of doing business should not be only on by word. Like Mr. Dalmia mentioned, it should percolate to the ground. And also, sir, there is nothing better, like Mr. Virmani said, like production-linked incentives should be given for all sectors so that they all have a level field. We all are aware that China gives electricity, water, land at practically nil or lowest rates. Bank rate of interest there is also nominal. And even logistic costs are absolutely very low. Now, this sort of production-linked incentive must be extended to all sectors and industry members must be involved also. The relevant industry people should be involved also so that the industry doesn't want excessive production-linked incentive, but the correct production-linked incentives. Dr. Virmani and Dr. Charan Singh, we shall take your suggestions on GST, Directive Taxes Code, and other topics. We look forward to your gui continued guidance and interaction with our members. So please rest assured, we'll be after you. You are a wealth of knowledge, and we need that wealth of knowledge to be able to give good valued suggestions to the government. I again thank you very much. And I would also like to thank our, uh, thank Dr. S.P. Sharma, Chief Economist of PhD CCI and the team. Thank you, Jai Hind and God bless everyone. Thank you very much, sirs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, our esteemed speakers, uh, Dr. respected Dr. Virmani ji and uh, Dr. Charan Singh ji and uh, all the participants. And we look forward uh, for more such sessions uh, on the topical issues. Thank you very much for joining.